right on time. You wanted to know about B-17 pilot training. Well, largely it's a matter of putting across what we know about the airplane, what it'll do and what it shouldn't be asked to do. Maybe airplanes are like people. You don't really get to know them until after you've lived with them a while. It takes time, too, to get well acquainted with an airplane. Time to find out just how far you can go with her and still stay friends. That's important. And men like our instructor have lived with this airplane long enough to become pretty good friends with her. So his job is just a matter of giving you the benefit of his experience. The procedure is pretty well standardized, and you'll learn to be thankful for that. Routine, like this circle tour of the airplane at the start, for instance, makes the student's life a lot simpler. In the cockpit, you'll learn to follow the checklist, because it helps you to keep your mind on your work. Detail's important when you're flying a big bomber. And using the checklist means you don't overlook a thing. After you get the plane off the ramp and down near the runway, you're ready for the run-up. One of the most important checks of all. Center at an angle. That gets all your props safe over concrete for the run-up. And if there's a guy behind you, you won't blast them when you rev them up. As your co-pilot, the instructor locks the tail wheel while she's rolling, so that when the wheel's in line, the lock pin will drop into place. Tail wheel locked, and... Brakes! Brakes set. Maybe here you'll switch to interphone. Easier to talk that way. Then the checklist again, and the instructor's command to check trim tabs. Set them at zero. Elevator trim tab, rudder, aileron. Then, before the run-up, always check your oil temperature. You ought to have at least 40 degrees before beginning the run-up. Why not close cow flaps? Hurry up a little. It might mean trouble. If you close them, you get uneven cooling, local hot spots, metal fatigue. I get it. Just like bending a wire back and forth until it breaks. That's it. Exercise turbos? Right. You advance throttles to 1,500 RPM for turbo exercise. And you know why it's important. To get warm oil circulating through the turbo regulators. If regulator oil is stiff or congealed, the turbo waste gates won't react properly. One avoidable cause of a runaway turbo on takeoff. Leaving turbos on, you do a repeat on the props. Give them plenty of time to change pitch. Watch the tax for that. If it's below freezing, exercise both turbos and props four times. Set the lock to keep the levers from creeping. And then, turbos off. And before the mag check, another important detail. Before you rev them up, turn on your generators and check each one for ampere output. If they balance, they're all putting out all right. Amp here, I'll put OK. Now voltage and then turn them off. Twenty-eight and a half on each. Generators checked and off. Check mags at 28 inches, starting with number one. While you're boosting manifold pressure, you remember there's a backfire hazard during the mag check. So you check turbos off, waste gates open, just to be sure. Oh. Left. Don't watch the tank. Watch the engine. Roughness doesn't always give you a quick drop in RPM. Both. Right. Both. Throttle up to the stop. A quick check of manifold pressure. And then full turbo. Since you're using 91 grade fuel here, you can't draw 46 inches. Power's cut about 10%. You set your lock, check RPM, a little below 2,500 on this fuel, take a look at the engine, and everything okay. Back slowly on the throttle because of the induction backfire hazard. Same procedure on all engines.
back to command to call the tower for takeoff clearance. And you're off to the races. Lock tail wheel. Parking brakes. Hold it with your feet on the runway. Less has it if you have to get away fast. Gyro. Set the gyro compass and check your compass heading against the heading of the runway. Gyro set. Generators. Generators on. Tell we're locked. Light out. Now let's see your rider. Three point takeoff. Three point? Three point. Hold the tail down, but don't give it enough pressure to cause a lot of wheel drag. And remember, you fly the airplane. I'll watch the engine. The cow flaps open? Right. Hold the brakes until you get 25 inches, then let her go. You'll have rudder control by the time you're hitting 50 miles an hour. With a crosswind, you might have to use the throttles a little. Rudder's enough today. On 100 octane, you'd be using 46 inches and 2,500 RPM. Little less than that with this fuel. You'll leave the ground at around 100 miles an hour. Then a kick on the brakes to stop the wheel spin and gear up. Get rid of that drag fast. In takeoff emergencies, the bare belly is better than wheels. Check the light. Visual inspection later. 130 safe airspeed for power reduction. Manifold pressure first. Pilot's job, but today your instructor does it. Then RPM. You'll find it all in the tech orders and your checklist. Co-pilot trails call flaps, returning each valve to the locked position. Check your landing gear. Up left. Up right. And when your flight engineer gets an OK on the tail wheel, the switch is returned to neutral. Things happen fast on the takeoff, and it's easy enough to tense up a little. You did well enough, but... Don't fight her, she won't throw you. On our next takeoff, you'll reduce power. I'll just make the final adjustments. Hold your airspeed to 135 on the climb. What's our power setting? 35 inches, 2300. Let's switch back to interphone again. Do you always use this power setting for climbing? Yes, with 91 grade fuel and up to 30,000 feet. If you're climbing on instruments, you should hold your airspeed at 160. Are you keeping her trimmed? Turbo and throttle settings always depend on altitude. For instance, if we'd taken off from a sea level field, we wouldn't need turbo or even full throttle for the early part of the climb. Another thing, always cut down manifold pressure before RPM. What's your altitude? We're nearly a thousand feet above the field. Fuel boost pumps off? At uh, 1,000 minimum. Check fuel pressure before and after. Gives you another check on engine fuel pump operation. Look at your manifold pressure. Manifold pressure will creep up steadily on the climb if you don't watch it. As free air pressure decreases on the climb, the pressure differential across the turbo buckets increases. Gives you higher turbo speed and more pressure from the blower. What about carburetor air filters? Turn them off at 8,000. Don't often hit dust above that. In emergencies, though, you can use them up to 15,000. Dust that high? No, not dust. Carburetor icing conditions. So now they're ice filters? Mm, in a way, yes. Filters off. Filters take air from inside the wing. In the kind of weather that ices up carburetors, air inside the wing is drier and warmer 
than that you'd get from the ram air intake. Fill the lights green, fill this off. Uh, check your manifold pressure. Turning the fill this off increases the manifold pressure about an inch and a half. With carburetor icing conditions, of course, you'd use intercoolers hot. But you won't normally get carburetor icing above 12,000. And up there, you'll always want intercoolers cold. Thin air means higher rate of compression from the supercharger, and compression makes heat. In the wrong places. Nearly always in the wrong places. You level off at 10,000 feet and cut her down to the proper setting for maximum long-range performance on 91-grade fuel. Manifold pressure down first to 28 inches. RPM next. You make this adjustment with one eye on the airspeed indicator because you use whatever RPM needed to get 150 miles per hour indicated. In this case, with your conditions, 1600 RPM. Then fuel mixtures to auto lean. And your co-pilot closes cowl flaps since you have a safe margin in head temperatures. What about the other power settings? Well, you've used three, modified for 91 grade fuel. Takeoff power, five minutes maximum continuous operation, climbing power, and maximum long range. They're all there on the panel. The power setting used in normal cruising is always figured from your flight conditions. Desired range, fuel available, weather conditions, altitude, gross weight, and perhaps one or two other things. In special cases, you'll always figure your best power setting from your flight computer. All settings are arrived at scientifically. Don't improvise. Plan the way they're written. And always keep an eye on your mixtures. In auto lean, don't use more than 29 inches with 91 grade and 2,000 RPM. Explain something? Try to. That three-point takeoff. What about it? Didn't it feel right? Well, maybe I didn't pull it right. I thought it was a little mushy. Isn't it better with the tail up? Well... And what about the stall hazard? Maybe we'd better figure it out on paper. Well, here we are. An old friend you'll remember from flying school days. She knows her way around. Call her tail up Myrtle. Now, take it easy, Myrtle. When Myrtle's parked on the ground, she's sure enough in a stalling or near stalling attitude. So on the takeoff, you lift the tail both to decrease drag and get a safe margin below the stall angle. And she takes off like a nice baby and there's no arguing about it. But with the missus here, it's different. In the three-point position, she's already in a flying attitude. On the takeoff run, the relative wind's parallel to the ground. So say the ground makes one leg of your angle of attack. Cord line makes the other leg. Angle of attack in three-point attitude, about 10 degrees. But with power on, the stalling angle for this airplane's about 19 degrees. So when you hold the tail down on the takeoff, you have a nice cozy margin of nine degrees below the stall angle. And when you leave the ground, the path of the relative wind changes so that the angle of attack actually decreases. You get maybe another four degrees of safety and you haven't a care in the world. Now let's dig a little deeper. Think of the forces at work when you take off as a team of little guys who are in there working for or against you all the time. For instance, gross weight of the airplane. On the ground, he bears down hard on the landing gear. When we're ready to start the takeoff run, you'll meet a pal of his. Wheel drag. The harder gross weight bears down on the wheels, the bigger and stronger wheel drag gets. That's definitely not good. Especially if your runway is soft or slushy. Think of lift as a kind of muscle man working from the wings, pulling up gross weight. Speed makes him pull harder. An increase in the angle of attack also makes him pull harder. Get the relationship between lift, weight on wheels, and wheel drag. The more lift, the less weight on wheels. Less weight on wheels, smaller wheel drag. Then, of course, there's thrust. He's your power. 
and aerodynamic drag. He's with you all the time, except when you're parked on the ground. Now, let's try to visualize what happens on a two-point takeoff. At the start of the run, lift increases steadily. Lift takes more and more weight off the wheels. Taking weight off the wheels steadily reduces wheel drag. Then, just when things are looking good, you lift the tail. Angle of attack decreases. That cuts down lift. Lift lets weight go back down on the wheels, and wheel drag increases again. Aerodynamic drag is cut a little, but not enough to compensate for the extra wheel drag. Speed still won't build up as fast as it would with the tail down. Even on a smooth runway, you'll need more room and maybe 20 or 30 miles an hour more speed to get off than if you'd kept your tail down. If the runway's messed up with mud or slush or water, maybe you won't get off at all in the space you have. But keep the tail down. Take advantage of the three-point angle of attack and lift goes to work on gross weight right away. Wheel drag gets smaller and smaller. You'll be airborne at maybe 100 miles an hour and without using up all your runway. And that's something to remember when you're lined up in a nice homemade strip in the jungle with mud underneath you and trees dead ahead. How do you like her? Try a little problem when you get over the field. Say you're coming in after a long mission, you're a little short on gas, and when you arrive, the field's closed in. Beeline for an alternate base. No, Sal, you're the hell and gone from nowhere. You're lucky to have one base to come home to. Well, cut the end boards and hang around until she opens up. Well, you're to hover all right, but don't cut the end boards. She'll burn more coal on two than she will on four on long-range settings. Think it over. All right, here we are. Granite stuff straight as below, up to, say, 2,000. Don't know when we'll be able to find a hole in it. Instrument letdown's out. What are you going to do? you like it up here? Like it better down a bit if I'm low on fuel. Need less power and less fuel for a given indicated airspeed. Air is not so thin. Props take fewer horses. Okay, that's part of it. When you get down to 8,000, you give the command for carburetor filters on, and you finally level off at around 500 feet above your theoretical overcast. When you level off above the overcast, the idea is to keep from going places. Now that's simple. Cut your speed down to 120, even if you have to reduce your RPM to 1250 to get it. Try it first with 1400 RPM. All right, reduce manifold pressure. Try it with 26 inches. Jettison the bombardier? No, your weight's all right. You've used up most of your gas on the way home, and I hope you didn't bring any bombs back. Cut your RPM down a little more. 1250's the minimum. With this hovering maneuver, fuel consumption's cut down to about 95 gallons an hour. At the end of a mission, you'll have a light load, so it's absolutely safe. Keep your banks at a 10 degree angle and just sit it out. Regular helicopter. Time to go in then. Landing instructions from the tower, weather, altimeter setting, and back to work again. When you're ready for a landing, be sure your co-pilot runs through the checklist. No matter how good you are, flying means fatigue, and fatigue does things to your memory. So if you want to bring in this property without an insurance claim, have everything checked in order. 
Altimeter, okay. Crew positions. Automatic pilot, off. Crew members at their proper stations. Side guns stowed. Ball turret guns up and pointing rear. Booster pumps on. Your power plant should be ready for full takeoff power in case a go-round is necessary. Mixtures auto-rich, intercoolers cold, carburetor filters on, wing de-icers off. That's important. Wing de-icer operation changes the stalling characteristics of the airplane. Tower, this is 641 on downwind leg, over. 641 on downwind leg, cleared to land, wheels down, over. Roger. Landing gear down. Down left. Down right. Tail wheel down, trailing antenna in. Check brakes and hydraulic pressure. Brakes okay. Pressure around 750. RPM 2100. Turbos set. Now we have power immediately available for a go round if we need it. Flap should be lowered on the downwind leg but not until air speeds below 147. One-third flaps on the downwing leg, full flaps on final approach. And if you have to go around, you don't need to milk up your flaps. They'll come up slowly enough. You hold air speed at 130 indicated on the base leg of the pattern. Then in a matter of seconds, you make your bank into the final approach. Flaps. High RPM. 120. 115. Don't close your throttles until you're sure of a landing. 112. 110. Freezer on. Hydraulic pressure's okay. Otherwise, you'd gun her and take off again. Cowl flaps open and locked. Turbos off. Booster pumps off. Wing flaps up. Get them up sooner if you have a muddy runway. Wheel unlocked. Generators. Generators off. Cutting the inboard engines is the co pilot's duty normally. The pilot should keep his mind on his taxi. But it's quiet on the hangar apron today, and the instructor asked you to do it. Good thing, too, since you weren't too sharp about it. You can cut your inboards now. Uh, check turbos off first. You need engine oil pressure to open the waste gates. No, no. Rev them up to a thousand before you cut them.
Parking brakes? No, hold it until the chocks are in. If you set your brakes on hot drums, you'll bake the expander tubes. until the engines have stopped turning over. Alden Tower, this is 641. Mission complete. See that all other switches are off before turning off the batteries in the main line. Booster pumps off. Landing gear, wing flaps, neutral. De icer, anti icer, off. Inverters? Inverters off only when the instruments have returned to neutral. Inverters off. Batteries off. Main line off. Lock control surfaces. That's that, except for the book work. Just give them the facts. One more thing. Record the time of day and number of minutes of oil dilution if you were diluting in this. Well, how do you feel? Okay, I feel great. Remember, it's, it's just another airplane. It's a little bigger than most. But the fact that you're flying here means that you've moved into the big time. And the payoff is it's the safest crate you ever flew. That's part of it. Not all of it by a long shot, but part of it at least. It's a little more complicated than a buckboard wagon. Still, on the other hand, it's not quite as elaborate as a battleship. Make things as easy for yourself as you can by taking advantage of little devices like the flight computer and the load adjuster and the checklist. All the rest, and that's plenty, is up to you. But I guess by this time you understand that pretty well.